The year is 1987, and Matthias Reust was going to save the world. The West German teen wasn't a fan of living as the sauerkraut in the middle of the world's sauciest nuclear sandwich, especially when neither side could agree to lay off the plutonium mayo. I guess I have to solve this myself, said the stupid, stupid boy. So the 18-year-old wrote a 20-page manifesto, a sentence that normally screams stay home from school, but this manifesto detailed instructions for Gorbachev on how to advance world peace. The next steps of his plan were rather simple. All he had to do was take this manifesto, hop in a Cessna, and fly from the West directly into Moscow where he could hand deliver it to Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev himself. With only 50 hours of flight experience, Matthias took to the skies and into Soviet territory. Air defenses were put on high alert. Soviet MiGs pulled up next to and flew by him, but much like an Activision Blizzard employee, Matthias wasn't going to take no for an answer. Through sheer dumb luck, every surface-to-air missile and fighter jet was denied permission to engage, assuming he was just a dumb student with his transponder turned off. They realized their mistake too late once Matthias landed an aircraft directly onto Red Square, marking the first time a German invasion ever got to Moscow. <laughs> what would Lenin think if he could see this? Oh, he's right there. After limited mingling, since he forgot one thing during his packing for a Russian diplomatic mission, the Russian language, he was arrested by the KGB and charged with not only violation of flight laws, but also malicious hooliganism, which if you've ever pounded dollaritas at Applebee's with Trey, you understand that term all too well. The embarrassment of the Soviet military gave Gorbachev the opportunity to push reforms and sack hundreds of military officials once it was shown they couldn't even shoot down a measly civilian aircraft, except for that one time. While he wasn't able to build his imaginary bridge between East and West, having at least somewhat of an impact helped Matthias handle this rejection well, but apparently only for two years as he later stabbed a woman to the brink of death for it. Why are you telling me all this? Just giving you some food for thought, Alex, because now it's up to you to end the Cold War and save the world. What? Why me? Why can't you leave me alone? Well, as you can see, I didn't do all that great of a job at it, and also, you're a lot of fun for me. But don't worry, champ, I've got a titillating tally of tales of wacky capitalists and commie shenanigans to help teach even you how to win the Cold War. Alright Alex, let's take you back to- <laughs> uh, Sorry about that Alex, one got away. What? You and the- One what? <laughs> Just a piece of my soul. I had the boys in the lab split mine up. Split your soul? Why? Why, to put the pieces in the marketable plushies, of course. Kinda like Harry Potter, but less stupid and British. Introducing the first limited edition Blue Jay plushie. I partnered up with the folks at YouTube for my first ever merch drop, creating a dazzling little dude that's perfect for all your plushie needs. Looking for a ceiling decoration? Not a problem. Need a confidant you can trust with all your secrets? He won't tell a soul. We tried. Want to put him in a jar? You can. Mad at me for making a mistake in a video? Brits use miles, not kilometers! Well, do we have an anger outlet for you. Jealous of my outdoor content adventures? Well, now you too can wiggle a bird plushie in front of a camera in public. It's too much fun! Still not convinced? Why don't I let this official review from Adam Driver change your mind? Merch. But my soul can only be split into so many pieces before I'm reduced to a shallow husk of a bird. So click the link below and throw your money at your screen before it sells out forever. And now, back to the video. It's the mid-1940s, the end credits roll on the World War sequel, and the Allies are partying in Berlin to celebrate Hitler's first good painting. But the fanfare can only be short-lived as a new tension was already brewing over the world's path forward. Capitalism or communism? At the helm of this debate were the two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, both of whom fought hard to collect economic allies than Nazi scientists. There was only room for one top gamer in this post-World War II scene, and as the main actors were now considering a trilogy, one was feeling rather confident with their early access to the nuclear DLC. And that is why we must abolish private property. Break free of your chains, comrade! Oh, I see. That makes a lot of sense. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But see this? Pretty cool, huh? Whoa, what is that? Capitalism, baby. I like that! Just wait till you see Chia Pets. Democracy is indispensable to socialism. <sighs> yeah, okay, buddy. I didn't want to go here, but under capitalism, our boys back in Los Alamos cooked up a fun new toy for us. <laughs> so you might want to reconsider. 
What's the matter? Gulag got your tongue? Wars were a lot more fun when you could kill civilians in very specific places, usually far away. But now that complete annihilation could be achieved from the press of a button by a teenager drafted from some farm in Idaho, countries were understandably a lot more hesitant to kick off World War III. Alright, we don't want a nuclear holocaust, so let's just set down our guns. But proxy wars aren't the only way to win the Cold War, Alex. Points towards victory could be scored through culture, intelligence, science, or military. Now let's take a look at what the US and Soviets did to try to score points in these categories. You got this idea from the Civilization games. Shut the fuck. This is different. When you think intelligence, you probably picture a charismatic Brit from the 50s, goofy spy gadgets and gizmos, or a charismatic Brit from the 60s, and maybe a certain blue bird from the internet? No? Okay. Anyway, while well, the reality of Cold War espionage consisted of a more mundane cocktail of surveillance and asset handling than a Gen 1, it did have its more shaken moments from time to time. Take Acoustic Kitty, the CIA project to transform your typical everyday cat into a world-class spy. The idea was to fit a cat with a microphone and radio and train them to approach Soviet officials to catch all that juicy commie gossip. Wouldn't they easily see a microphone and transmitter on a cat? <laughs> well, only if they're on top of the skin. What? Those lab boys back in the CIA dungeons decided to cook up a little Franken-kitty, surgically implanting a microphone in a cat's ear canal, a transmitter at the base of its skull, and an antenna down the spine and tail just beneath the fur. With their crime against nature complete, they just needed to train the cat, deciding to use audio cues to control its directions. But as you cat owners already know, it doesn't matter how close you can get a cat to Robocop, they'll always end up doing whatever they want. So while initial testing went well, outside the lab, it would just wander off whenever it got bored or hungry. And it was then that the CIA realized their mistake in this whole operation. <laughs> they forgot to bypass that pesky sense of hunger. After one more operation, their abomination was now trained, wired, and hungered for nothing but tanky blood. The perfect cocktail of conditions for its first mission. Okay, we're here. Time to let the cat out of the bag. I'm reporting you to HR, Scott. Okay, Agent 009 Lives, this is what we've been training for, all right, buddy? It'll be a quick in and out, 20 minute mission. Just walk up to the guys on the bench and listen to what they have to say. Don't let curiosity kill the cat. <laughs> why, why are you allowed to? Because I have tenure, Scott. All right, Agent, here we go. Oh shit, Carl! Carl, grab me that shovel from the back! We gotta scrape this guy off! According to Victor Marchetti, the cat was released from an unmarked van to eavesdrop on two men outside the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C. when it was hit by a taxi almost immediately. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you had a lot riding on this Acoustic Kitty project, Ryan, but don't worry. I've had the boys back in the lab work on a new project that's sure to cheer you right up. Introducing Electric Kitty. <laughs> Robert Wallace disputed this bitter end, stating that in reality, the project was abandoned because the cat was too hard to train. Therefore, the equipment was surgically removed and it lived a, quote, long and happy life afterwards. Whether you believe the comically bad ending or the suspiciously happy one is up to you. But regardless, Acoustic Kitty took five years and 20 million dollars just to end up in the trash can. Kinda like my college degree. But with that big of an investment, I guess the lesson we could take away here is that there's more than one way to skin a cat. I hate you so much. How about we take a peek at Soviet espionage, Alex? Ah, ah, ah! Oops, <laughs> looks like someone wasn't a good double agent. Jesus, uh, ooh, was that necessary? Yeah, nobody really likes intel leaks, especially the Soviets, whose counterintelligence programs were far superior to the West. The key to their effectiveness was quite simple. All they needed was a totalitarian state with an authoritarian government who gave them free reign to target absolutely any threat to sensitive intelligence, whether real or imaginary. As you can guess, many innocents were executed through these tactics, but their deaths would not be in vain, Alex. Alex, for this aggressive mindset helped perfect Soviet murder tactics. Introducing the Bulgarian Umbrella, perfect for all your rainy day and political dissident silencing needs. While appearing as an ordinary umbrella on the surface, this crafty device contained a hidden pneumatic mechanism that shot a ricin-filled pellet just 1.5 millimeters thick, or 15 254 the thickness of a gumball to help you visualize. This elusive gadget made perfect for an assassin who needed a masquerade as, say, a comically inconspicuous British aristocrat on his morning stroll over a London bridge, which just so happens to be the exact circumstances where one Georgi Markov was assassinated in 1978. Hello fellow Brit. Hello. I see you've noticed my umbrella. As my babushka always said, Simrasatmir Adinotresh. 
Oh, I mean grandmother. <laughs> Why does your umbrella have a mag? In case I need to reload. You never know when you might miss. Z the rain. <laughs> uh oh, looks like it's raining. Here, let me open my umbrella for you. Georgi Markov was a Bulgarian dissident writer who defected to London in 1969, where he continued to critique the Bulgarian government at the BBC and Radio Free Europe. But even with all traces of his name and books scrubbed away in Bulgaria, dictator Todor Zivkov couldn't stand Markov's continued existence smearing his name overseas. Ugh, what a day. Maybe I'll listen to some BBC. I think I've earned being a little naughty. <laughs> this just in, Bulgarian correspondent Georgi Markov has informed the BBC that Todor Zivkov, quote, pours his milk before his cereal because he's a big, stinky, dumb poopy head. Well, yeah, I say, that is poopy head behavior, Todd. With technical assistance from the Soviet KGB, Zivkov had the Bulgarian Secret Service assassinate Georgi Markov on his own birthday. The writer was on Waterloo Bridge in London when he felt a sharp pain in the back of his leg and turned to find a man pick up an umbrella and immediately immediately step into a taxi. He became sick that same evening and four days later he was dead. After an autopsy, a metal pellet with drilled holes was discovered in his leg and the media went crazy over the umbrella murder story. On paper, this sounds like a textbook espionage dub for the Eastern Bloc, but then again, when the Bulgarian umbrella is more present in Western media than actual history, who really benefited most at the end of the day? I mean, I don't know if you can really call an episode of NCIS as capitalizing more than an actual assassination. You're right, I'm just being facetious. The Soviets definitely take the intelligence dub in the spout. While the CIA get points for creativity, coming up with an intricate and elaborate cyborg cat spy thing, the Soviets kept it simple. Squeeze air and poison go forward. So Alex, the lesson here is that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how cunning or crafty you try to be, you'll never be as effective as good old fashioned murder. Next up is the science victory, and what better bout of science and history is there than the space race? The space race was a competition between the Americans and Soviets for superior spaceflight capability. And while many people today think this was settled when Elon bitch slapped Bezos by putting a Tesla into orbit, the real story is much more nuanced. Both nations have their aerospace origins and the late 19th, early 20th centuries with Konstantin Tsiolkovsky and Robert Goddard, who are considered two of the founding fathers of aeronautics. Both of these guys made a bunch of important early rocket advancements. For example, Goddard is notable for inventing the first liquid-fueled rocket. Sir, I did it! Come quick! The Soviets are so fucked in 40 years. Most people crown the Nazis as the sole king of early rocketry, but both the US and Soviets have been progressing in these fields as well. In fact, the Soviets' rocket tech was on par with the Nazis in the early 1930s. That is, until Stalin's policies slowed things down a bit. What are you talking about? Ah! Jesus Christ! Nevertheless, the Soviets kicked off the space race by launching the first ever artificial satellite, Sputnik 1, a big metal ball with four antennas, a clear nod to the all-powerful flying spaghetti monster. Inside the little satellite was a radio that transmitted menacing beeps to the people below, sending a clear message of its existence and terrifying Americans as it flew overhead. Welcome back to WTTL, your station for all things Elvis, but first, a message from our sponsor, Dr. Lang's Lobotomies, ideal for hysterical women. Use code BRAINBLAST for 20% off for Nog in November, and remember, you're one snip away from a wife who obeys. Oh, oh, I hate that. The Soviets immediately responded with Sputnik 2, this time putting the first animal into orbit, a dog named Laika. They just snatched a random stray, figuring if anything can survive the hellscape that was the Moscow streets, then the literal exosphere shouldn't be that different. After a bunch of training, Laika was strapped up and launched into orbit. She was never intended to survive the mission, so they planned to ease her suffering with some poisoned food later in the trip, which would have been great if she hadn't been roasted in a makeshift air fryer in the first few hours when an engine failed to separate. This could be due to the fact that the spacecraft was both designed and built in only four weeks in order to hit the launch deadline. America responded with their own launch and the formation of NASA. Both sides are now just popping off more satellites, dogs, monkeys, and finally naked monkeys, with Yuri Gagarin beating Alan Shepard to the punch as first talking animal in space by just a few weeks. Things then started getting real serious when John F. Kennedy got elected and announced the U.S. would throw a dude on that cool rock in the sky by the end of the decade. Congratulations on your election, President Kennedy. Uh, just to get you up to speed on things, the Cold War has been progressing. Cold War, huh? I'll show those Soviets cold. Grab those NASA nerds, General! We're going to space! N no, not that kind of cold. Fuck it! The moon! But don't. Right away, sir. Consider it done. Good. Sorry about that. He would have just kept going. D does he seriously not know what Cold War means? Just 
humor him for now. All problems will be solved in Dallas. After many achievements on both sides, like the first spacewalk and the first docking in space, the US would go on to do just that, fulfilling man's innate desire to secure the biggest rock on the playground with the Apollo program. While putting a guy on the moon is cool and all, it's not as cool as the first living beings to reach the moon. Tortoises. The Soviets decided to shoot a pair of them around the moon, probably because they saw America put out a movie called Planet of the Apes and were like, Suka blitz, choosing an animal with natural armor in case any space monkeys came across. Clubbing. I think you know that's not the case. We're talking about space flight, Alex. Can't you let a bird dream? The tortoises made it around the moon, and unlike earlier, these animals returned safely to be rescued and dissected. The US also had its fun share of animals in space. My favorite being the time they shot a bunch of jellyfish into the cosmos. For science. They swear. 2,000 of the little critters went up, and chemicals were used to get them swimming and reproducing, which they did. Very well. They landed with 60,000, but once the astrofish came back, they weren't able to swim around very well because they just straight up didn't have a concept of gravity. Ugh, run, Aaron! Gravity doesn't apply to them! <laughs> The Space Age deserves an entire video of its own, but I know you nerds are foaming at the mouth to hear who I think won the space race. Let me just put it this way. Between the two countries, only one killed the cutest dog I've ever seen and later had their own scientists regret it and claim they didn't get enough out of the mission to justify her death. So that's about as clear of an L as I've ever seen. And if you want my more detailed answer, you have to wait for my behind the scenes commentary on my second channel. You're really going the gatekeeping shameless plug route? Shh, can you hear that? No? That's right. There's no one to hear you scream. Next up is the culture section, and just to be upfront, America wins this category, hands down. Kids are hitting layups in Mongolia. But for the sake of checking all our boxes, we're gonna talk about it anyway. Soda, pop, or carbo, as I guess some degenerates call it, is just about as synonymous with America as the bald eagle itself. And that was precisely the problem for Georgi Zukov. Hero of the Soviet Union, defeater of Nazis, Zukov became a big fan of Coca-Cola ever since Eisenhower introduced him to it around the time of World War II. But the delicate fizzy cocktail was banned in the Soviet Union, and Zukov, being prominent in the public eye, couldn't be seen consuming a symbol of American imperialism. We know what happens when Stalin gets cranky. <laughs> So he decided to reach out to U.S. President Harry Truman for a solution to his dilemma. President Truman? Zuki, are you considering defecting? No, stop asking. I was actually calling to see if you could help me acquire some coke. Well, we were saving most of it for black neighborhoods, but I think we can work something out. No, wow, Jesus, that's... I'm talking about Coca-Cola. I can't be seen getting it in the Soviet Union. They wouldn't allow for it. Can you help me out with this? <gasps> Maybe you could? Other than overthrowing my government. Ah! I'll get you one of these days. Let me see if I can work something out. Truman reached out to Coca-Cola, who then developed White Coke, a special clear version of Coke that had its food coloring removed and was packaged in clear glass bottles with a white cap and red star. This way, when Zukov wanted a nice, refreshing Coke, the public wouldn't see their idol drinking a Yankee abomination, just half liters of vodka. In the image of war hero turned alcoholic veteran was a Soviet-fitting brand the public could very much so get behind. But let's check on America and the yin to Coca-Cola's yang, Pepsi. In 1959, Pepsi participated in the American National Exhibition in Moscow, where we showed off what it means to be an American. Here we see Soviets observing a motionless car from behind, an allusion to driving in an East Coast city. Over here, Khrushchev is experiencing the wonder that is an American kitchen. Will he try his hand at operating the washing machine? Haha, <laughs> no, they brought a woman for that. Gee, watching your wife work sure is tiring. How about a nice refreshing Pepsi to take the edge off? This photo was exactly the marketing juice PepsiCo needed in the ongoing cola wars and it led to Pepsi acquiring a monopoly on cola in the Soviet Union. With restrictions on the ruble, Pepsi exchanged their scrumptious syrup for vodka, which they could then sell for cash. This deal remained in place until Pepsi's growth outpaced the vodka's growth, leading to a renegotiation. Yeah, this vodka deal was great and all, but there are only so many kids with fake IDs in the States. Not to worry, comrade. We've arranged an offer for you. What is this? Something to go with naval fleet. Ah, there it is. What are you doing? You wanted me to bring something new to the table, so I bring ships to table. Thank you, Igor. Pajalsta. Ah, figuratively! Bring something figuratively to the table! And why would I want a naval fleet? To help with your current conflict with Coca-Cola. You are in Cola War, are you not? Ah, 
Figuratively! The Soviet Union gave Pepsi 17 submarines, a cruiser, a frigate, and a destroyer as payment for soda. You may have heard this story before, as it's become somewhat of an internet legend in recent years, with articles in your know-it-all nerd friend Kevin claiming this trade made Pepsi the sixth largest navy in the world at the time. This actually wasn't quite the case. These vessels were outdated and gonna be sold for scrap, but even still, they wouldn't have made Pepsi even remotely close to the sixth largest navy in the world at the time. In fact, when I dug into the story deeper, there seemed to be a lot of scrutiny as to whether or not this even happened in the first place. I was able to find two articles from 1989 claiming the sale did take place, and political expert Dr. Paul Musgrave wrote a feature about the story, and says that it definitely happened and is attested to in other sources. To me, it seems most likely that Pepsi acted as a sort of middleman in the exchange of Pepsi for a few million dollars worth of Soviet vessel scrappage. But this was just a small fry compared to the big kahuna that would transpire the coming year. A multi-billion dollar deal where the Soviets would build brand spanking new oil tankers for Pepsi. That's right, liquid gold for fizz to behold. Things were starting to look up for little old Pepsi. Ah. Well, surely a multi-decade monopoly would consolidate a strong lead in the market. Oh, that's embarrassing. Last but not least, we have the military category. The US and Soviets had to get creative with this one. As in the world of nuclear juiciness, we typically want to avoid terraforming the Earth into a radioactive wasteland. But the moon is fair game. It's 1958, Americans are panicking after the Sputnik launch, and the US needed a strong response to show they weren't falling behind. Okay boys, where's Captain Lloyd? I believe he's taking his wife to an appointment at Dr. Lang's lobotomies. Ah, about time. Anyway, let's get started. We need to do something big to boost public morale. What do you got for us, General Clint? The Army is working on our own satellite program. I say we put our faith in the Explorer 1 launch. That'll be good, but we'd still only be second. What about you, Major Tom? I believe we should focus on Project Mercury sir, and putting the first man in space. Good, I like it. And your thoughts, Alfred the Moon Hater? The United States kicked off Project A119, a plan to detonate a nuclear bomb on the moon's surface. Their hope was that the explosion would be large enough to be visible from Earth with the naked eye, and consequently boost public morale once they witnessed the extent of America's might. But of course, they need to sell some additional reasons beyond explosions are sick, bro. So it would help answer some rudimentary astrogeological questions? What? Yeah, science and shit. A team of America's top minds got to work calculating the sweet spot between popping off the world's most expensive firecracker and flashbanging the northern hemisphere while kinetically bombarding Venus. They landed on a warhead with a 1.7 kiloton yield, detonated right on the ironically named Terminator line, where the light side of the moon touches the dark side, but not too far over where it's all dark and scary. While it was found to be technologically feasible, this project was cancelled for a few reasons. One, they were afraid of the danger to the public if the launch were to fail, which if we just take a peek at launch success rates in the 50s and 60s, uh, we'd call this worrisome. Two, potential nuclear fallout would have made the moon landing photos look less like a heroic triumph and more like an HBO show. And three, because they feared exploding nukes on the moon might look, you know, cartoonishly evil or something. Personally, if it were up to me, I'd say act first, make YouTube apologies later. <sighs> That's why we wouldn't put you in positions of power. Right you are, Alex. I would just take it by force. But how to overthrow a democratic government is a video for another day. Let's see what the Russians have in store for the military category. Long range bombers were all the rage in the mid 20th century. After all, you needed some way to bring the bigger and brighter suns you're building to all your friends. And with advancements in anti-air shooty things, these bombers needed to fly higher and faster to keep their spicy little presence safe. Introducing the Tu-22, the first supersonic bomber to enter production in the Soviet Union, even after both prototypes were destroyed in testing, killing multiple people. Ah, third time's the charm, eh? <laughs> Begin full production, we'll fix it on the go. And fix it on the go, they did not. While it had an intimidating look that was really hammered home by some impressive chompers, this would turn out to be more of a warning to its own crew than adversaries, as it was plagued with a stupendous amount of serious problems. Design issues included wings that would deform and partially melt at high speeds, terrible stability that had the pilot essentially arm wrestling the yoke the entire flight to keep being a plane, and a terrible cockpit layout that was described as a quote, inverted hedgehog, with levers so far out of reach that pilots had to improvise ropes and hooks to operate them. But perhaps my favorite design flaw was the ejection system, which didn't shoot crewmen upwards like you'd imagine, that's where the precariously placed turbines sat hungry for breakfast, but rather below the plane. 
where the ground is. This meant that ejections were only safe above 350 meters, and when you take into account most accidents occur during takeoff and landing, you might as well stick it out if you run into trouble on the runway, or risk being turned into fertilizer. There were even times where people just straight up fell out of the plane. Granted, this would happen while the aircraft was parked and safely intact unlike the crew's spines. All of this would earn the bomber one of its many colorful nicknames, Man Eater, due to its quirky little knack of killing many of its own crewmen with an astronomical failure rate of 70 units lost out of 311 produced. For my Baldur's Gate friends out there, that's roughly equivalent to rolling a D4, and if it's a 1, you die. All things considered, pilots were not very excited to fly this death trap. However, it was an extremely sought after assignment for crews. And that, my dear Alex, can be traced back to the coolant System. Coolant? That's right, Alex. The cockpit had an overheating problem that was solved with an evaporator supplied with a shocking amount of coolant. This coolant was a mixture of 60% distilled water and 40% ethanol. And when we pour that into our handy little analyzer here, it ran on vodka? It ran on vodka, yes. Naturally, there were numerous reports of crews drinking the plane's coolant and getting, quote, paralytically drunk, earning the plane its most popular nickname, Supersonic Booze Carrier. Pilots of the bomber even had complete control over how much coolant was consumed during flight, or if any was used at all. Jesus, you look terrible. My name's actually Vlad, but thank you, sir. I just need to cool off. Did you and Alec run out of coolant? Oh, yeah. <gasps> we used it up real fast, and we didn't kiss or anything. What? I'm just saying, I didn't kiss a guy. I was just asking- You're just coming off really accusatory and I just want to be crystal clear that I did not gingerly touch lips with Alec. Nothing happened. Right. D do you need more coolant then? <sighs> That would be most appreciated. Interestingly, it appeared as though the coolant was utilized with a shocking efficiency, as air crews post flight reports would show 100% of it was used during flights. The Air Force would later crack down on this, restricting access to bombers between flights and closely monitoring coolant levels. However, keeping Russians from vodka is like trying to keep predators from Roblox, so they found a way to keep the practice alive anyway. While neither of these stories are really strong wins for either side, I'd have to award the Soviets the point for this one, as between the two, well, it actually happened, and for all its flaws, you mean people dying? For all its flaws, it at least helped boost airman morale. And as my cool college friend Scott once said, stop bringing your Game Boy to the club, I mean, when life leaves you drowning in stress, might as well choose the liquid. He flunked out, but I think the wisdom still stands. So, Alex, looks like we've got a solid tie here. Think you've got what it takes to win this Cold War? What? Half of these stories were disasters! I didn't learn anything useful! I've got no idea what to do! Alex, Alex! What did Scott say about drowning? Ch choose the fluid? Choose the fluid, Alex. Attaboy. Now plug my merch. Good, good. The Cold War. Nine out of ten stars.